Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium. And we're making now another video on Bayesian testing. So I've kind of illustrated the points of Bayesian testing in my last video where we talked a lot about the comparison between hypothesis testing and Bayesian testing and why Bayesian testing would potentially be, you know, more interpretable, easier to read, and also how Bayesian testing the results more represent probabilities as we understand them. Now, um, I'm going to be repeating cer certain um, concepts that I mentioned in that video, just so that it flows into the current topic of the video, which is Bayesian testing for continuous variables. Um, so let's just kind of get started with everything. All right, so the first is, well, we define our experiment. We're using a currently a data set, so I wanted to make sure that there's at least a story around this because there's always context to data. So let's say that now you are running an e-commerce company and you want to test some changes that you made to a page. It could be an algorithmic change, just a small button change or some physical changes onto the page. The control group, they're half your users who get the old page that is the current version. And then you have the treatment group who are the new users that get the new page with the new changes. And let's say for now that the primary metric uh, that you want to track and decide whether or not you are going to be accepting or rejecting these changes is going to be purchase conversion. Now, purchase conversion is a binary, well, purchase conversion is, well, technically a binary metric of like, you can either convert or not convert. But when you're taking an aggregation, uh, it can range from a value, like a bunch of users together, purchase conversion ranges from like zero to one. So it would be the number of uh, converted users to the number of exposed users, kind of like what we're seeing right here. So converted, exposed users are users who have seen the page during the experiment time, hence they are exposed to the page. And of those users, how many of them actually converted will give us like a percentage or a number between zero and one, and that will be purchase conversion. And we're using that metric to decide whether or not to go forward with the changes. Now, the entire notebook right now here kind of just represents us using um, Bayesian analysis to say, okay, if the purchase conversion of control is this much and the test is this much, there might be a difference and we can now quantify like how confident we are in that difference. Um, in the next notebook, which I'll get to soon, uh, if we add another metric that's not just a binary metric, instead of purchase conversion, it could be like GMV, or that is like pricing information, for example. How would we use Bayesian testing or analysis for assessing the difference between the control and test group in that situation? So that's kind of like what we're going to be covering in this entire video. And uh, yeah, let's just, uh, let's just get to some good old fashioned code. So in this second section over here, we're using certain A-B test data. I've just uh, imported that as a CSV, and you can see a couple of columns here. So a couple of samples here, sorry. So every row is an exposure. So we have a user ID, uh, the timestamp at which the user was shown the page. They're the treatment group if they got the new page, or the control group if they got the old page. And this number is either 0 or 1, 0, not converted. It changes to 1 if a user makes a purchase within like seven days of their first exposure. So pretty hopefully straightforward to understand data. Now, um, in this data set, we actually have three weeks worth of data. And there's over almost 300,000 users, which are split between test and control. So we have quite, a, quite the generous uh, data set here. Now, I've noticed that in certain situations, though, that certain users are double exposed. So you have users who, you know, have both received both the new page and the old page, which could have probably been some technical glitch in the systems. And what I'm doing right now is since there is only like I've assessed that there's one percent of these values. Yeah. So one point three, four percent of users have been exposed to both. Then I just decided to remove them. It won't affect the analysis that much. And so we now have a clean data set. I've also added a week column, which is basically going to simulate the idea of how an experiment is carried out. Like you don't make a dashboard and after the end of like four weeks and then just start looking at the dashboard, then you would be looking at it at, you know, different intervals during the experiment time. And so like, I'm going to say like what I'm going to be doing in the future is, well, all of those exposure timestamps that happen in the first week, I'm only considering them. And I want to see what the results looked like at that point of time. After the second week, I want to see how the results looked with two weeks of data. 
third week, I wanna see how it looked with three weeks of data and so on, so we can actually see how these numbers change over time. Yep, and yeah, that's it. So onto this section over here is basically going to start by illustrating the frequentist approach and comparing it to the, um, the Bayesian approach. Now, with the frequentist approach, we tend to make uh, we tend to make hypotheses. We use hypotheses like, okay, uh, let's say that since we're using purchase conversion, which is a binary metric, we would use probably something like the chi-square test, where the null hypothesis is that the control and treatment are independent of each other. And you know how hypotheses tests work, right? So at the end of the test, you'll probably get a test statistic and a p-value. And using the p-value, like if it's 0.05 significance level, if it is above or below that, we will choose to either reject or not reject the null hypothesis. But there is a little bit of a problem here. So in this case, let's say the chi-score value is 1.28 and the p-value, it is 0.288, which is well above the 0.05 level. Now. What it's actually saying, technically, is there's a 28% probability that a more extreme chi-square value than this 1.128 would have occurred by chance. Now, obviously, well here, maybe the chi-square test is just not the best test to use here specifically because it is kind of a, a weak test in general, here at least. And even if this was a stronger test though, we're seeing that this probability is in terms of the test statistic itself, which is like the chi-squared statistic. And we'd have to map that to purchase conversion, which is really the metric we care about. And so doing that mapping, it kind of gets a little confusing about like, okay, what is the actual difference between the lift in purchase conversions between the control and test? So it's a little hard to interpret, right? And that's kind of what I've summarized in this figure here too. So in the frequency approach, we have control and treatment data. We have a hypothesis, which is our null hypothesis we get two scalar values and from which we can make like an assumption, like a statement like this. But if we use the Bayesian testing approach where we have, instead of a hypothesis, we input a prior, which is, you know, knowledge about, about like the, about purchase conversion before we have conducted the experiment. And this is a distribution by the way, which I'll get to. The output of this experiment, Bayesian experiment is not two scalar values, but it's two posterior distributions. And when you have two distributions, you can do whatever you want. We can make statements like, oh, we are X percent confident that the lift is Y. Like the probability that um, the difference between control and treatment is like 2% is this percentage. And that, since it's in terms of the actual metric of interest, it is so much easier to communicate results and understand what it actually means. So because of this, like Bayesian tests just become so powerful and it's very important to understand and hence the point of this video. Now, um, in the Bayesian approach, I kind of like illustrate exactly like each of these components and how, uh, how we actually come about, you know, constructing the prior and the posterior and whatnot. So in this case, let's just see in the Bayesian approach right now. So we need to construct the prior. The prior is a distribution. It is a distribution of purchase conversions, which is the metric we care about. Now, note that the purchase conversion is a probability. It's a value that lies between zero and one. And a distribution of probabilities is best modeled with something called a beta distribution. Now, there is an entire resource on um, how to understand like what the beta distribution is. I'll, I'll link this to below this um, article. I'll link it below. And it's a really good read just to understand what it actually represents and how you can update these values to create a posterior distribution. Posterior meaning data. After you see the data, what is the distribution you have now? Okay, let's go back here. Um, all right, so with the prior data, like I said, now in, in our current experiment, I only wanna use the first weeks of data for the prior. Now in um, actual, uh, you know, actual working data, you already have this prior information, you know, like from before the experiment time. So you don't really need to do this, but this is a data set. And my only way to construct a prior is to use just the initial data itself. So I'll consider like the first week of control data to be used to construct the prior. And what we're doing is now we're sampling, we're sampling like for, from the prior set, we are sampling like a thousand, uh, samples and then we would determine purchase conversions for each of them 
And we do that 10,000 times. So we have like a list of this, like these numbers between zero and one, which is a size 10,000. And you, when you have numbers like that, you can now use that to fit a beta distribution to those numbers, which is exactly what we do here. Now, um, I put num weeks here is two, which basically says, hey, let's just look at um, from week one to week two. I mean, that, well, technically it's only one week, right? Beginning of week one to beginning of week two. We want to see what the experiment would have said, like after one week of running this test, right? Uh, and so I basically come up with the statistics right here, which is essentially after one week of running the test, we would have seen that the difference in purchase conversions is 0 0.009 with the control slightly higher than the test, right? And what I'm doing now is I'm using the priors that I constructed to create a posterior distribution, a distribution constructed after seeing data. So essentially, I update the alpha value to include the users and the number of users who have converted, and then the beta values to up by updating it by like considering the users who were exposed but did not get converted. Now there is a there is quite a bit of mathematics that's involved in deriving like why you have to update um, a prior in this way to construct a posterior. But you know, like I said before, I pro I think it's best to like defer to this blog post here where they kind of do the same thing where they're kind of um, modeling hitting rates and hitting averages or batting averages in baseball, which kind of models the same thing as like a probability, kind of like purchase conversion. And this is the posterior here. So I give it a read. There's also a math at this link to derive exactly why this is the case and why this update happens here. So take a look at that. So now that we have our lift, um, we now know what this lift is, and we have constructed our posterior distribution. We can then um, sample, now we have two distributions, so we can do whatever we want. So let's sample like a thousand from the test distribution, a thousand from the control posterior distribution, and start comparing them. And lo and behold, if we start comparing them, and we can finally actually get the probability of why the treatment is greater than control. So basically, it's a mean of the values of where, you know, the treatment is greater than control would essentially reflect the probability that the treatment is greater than the control group, right? And we see that there is like a 32.6% chance that treatment is greater than control, which is fine. It kind of makes sense. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it here. Now, if I, let's say that we wanted to run this test for another week and then see how, it, how these numbers shake out. So let's change this two to three. And essentially now from this line, it'll take week two and week three as the data. And okay, now we now have new numbers. Still, uh, the control is slightly better off. But when you execute this now, you'll see that the probability that the treatment is granting control is even less. So essentially what's happening is that the distributions are getting narrower and narrower and more precise. So it's actually easier to quantify even smaller differences. And this is also owing to the large amount of data that this data set has to offer. Um, I can say that the distributions are getting narrow because I can see this. See, the variance here from the previous case was 2.24 times 10 to the power minus 6. But now if you execute it, it's literally half of that, right? And even with statements like this, we are able to say, you know, okay, the probability that we're seeing a 2% lift is 6.3%, which is very, very low. And... I think you can see now how it's now easier to conclude, okay, the treatment is not really increasing purchase conversion that much, so we shouldn't really be moving forward if that's our main um, interest altogether. So yeah, that's kind of a good uh, summary and overview of like what we talked about in the last video too. And also, if purchase conversion is your primary metric and how to assess that with Bayesian testing. But let's say that for, for this situation, we are not necessarily just interested in purchase conversion as a metric, but we're also interested in, you know, what, what, what about the changes in price of purchase that would have happened? So instead of comparing purchase conversions, we want to compare a continuous metric like prices. How do we do that with Bayesian testing? And for that, I have another notebook. Notebooks are so fun. So in order to understand this, well, it, we would want to first like just understand how do prices behave in an actual e-commerce marketplace? So I kind of grabbed data from two data sets just to illustrate the point of like how prices are distributed. I plotted the distrib here's the first distribution that I just like took the data and I plotted the prices for the orders out. 
So you see that, well, first of all, it's always above zero, right? It's a con it's, it's nature of price. It is, um, a, there's a lot of orders that were made where the prices were low and a few orders that were made where the prices are high. And this number just keeps decreasing and decreasing as the price gets higher and higher, right? Um, interestingly, if you take this, if you take the log of every single point in this data and you then, you take the logarithm and you plot the distribution, you get a bell curve, which is like a normal distribution. And this isn't just this data too. Like I took another data set from this like Pakistani in e-commerce data set. And what happened here was, well, I saw the same first distribution of prices. And then if you take the log of those prices and plot a distribution, you get a normal distribution, which basically says that, well, in both cases, the purchase data is, can be modeled with a log normal distribution, right? So the distribution of the log of the prices actually follows, can be modeled by a normal distribution typically in e-commerce stores. And like how, how I modeled beta distribution for purchase conversion, I can model um, for uh, purchases and prices, I can model it using a log normal distribution. So cool, we got that as step one. Now I'm gonna be using the very same data set that you saw before, but I am going to do some magic over here in order to incorporate pricing information. So you saw it's the same exact data set before, but we have a price column too. So what I'm basically, uh, what I've basically done, done is like from the two data sets, I've constructed um, two distributions that I can sample from for treatment and control. So we have a treatment price sampler. If, if, like the, if the group is control, it's going to sample from the control uh, price sampler. If it was treatment, it would sample from the treatment price sampler over here. And so we have technically two distri different distributions of, of data. I've artificially also made treatment slightly more than the control, as you can see here in the price change right here. Um, I've just artificially made it more so that we can actually see some changes here um, in the results. But just letting you know, that's how I did it. Now, from here though, let's take a look at a little bit of Bayesian math. So the goal of Bayesian testing in general is to find a posterior distribution, like we mentioned before. Posterior distribution is the, you take your prior, you conduct an experiment, and you update your beliefs based on what you see in the experiment, and you have another distribution, which is your posterior. So that's, that's essentially model like P of theta given data, where theta are the parameters of your distribution, and data is your experiment that you're conducting, right? But we know, well, we want to actually model a log normal distribution because we want to find a log normal distribution for, for reprise so that we can sample prices from it. Um, now, in order to find a log normal distribution, it helps us to actually first find a normal distribution. And so let's assume that this P is now a normal distribution. And because it's normal, it is represented by two parameters. That is means and standard DV or mean and variance, right? Which we represent here. And so this becomes now our posterior. But this is in the form of like probability of A times B. And we know by modification of Bayes rule and also like the product rule that probability of A times B is the probability of A given B times the probability of B, which we represent over here. Now, there is some mathematics that revolves around, uh, you know, uh, exactly like simplifying this, but I've linked a book on Bayesian analysis over here. And according to this book, if you kind of go to chapter three and you actually refer some of these sections, it will say that, and let me go back here, that this first term, it can be sampled, it essentially takes the form of an inverse gamma distribution. And this second term takes the form of a normal distribution. So what this is, this tilde over here means is sampled from, right? And this, this term basically means in order to compute the mean, you need to take the standard deviation from, you need to take the standard deviation that we computed up here first. So it's a dependency, right? And all of these values that you see here that are, except for the sigma squared, they're all um, constants. They are prior constants. You see they're subscript by zero, which indicates they are prior hyperparameters that we just pass into, into, into these distributions. And then we can, we can also compute posterior values of the same constants right over here. I've just given formulations and you can refer to that link that I showed before right up here. Go to page 
68, chapter 3, and it will it will tell you everything. It will, I mean, I literally took the screenshot from there, so it'll tell you everything, and I don't want to explain too many things that will will kind of stray away from this entire explanation, so I do encourage you to go check it out. But anyways, all of this math, kind of, we whatever you see here, um, we're going to be coding it out. And so this is essentially a two-step process. We want to essentially get the means and standard deviations, right? That's how you get the normal posterior distribution. And you get, first, we'll compute the sigmas by sampling from the inverse, ga the inverse gamma distribution. And then we'll use the sigmas, the use, use the sigma squares to, def to, dis to determine the means that we sample from a normal distribution. Those are the two steps that I wrote here too. So, yeah. And if you code this all out in mathematical form, I get this function, right? So this chunk of data is for sampling the, st the sigma squares from the inverse gamma distribution. And this chunk of code over here is used to sample from the normal distribution. And so we get a, a set of mu's, the, each of these are lists. So this is like a set of like 10,000 or whatever I pass in mu's and a set of 10,000 sigmas, which are essentially represent or can be used to construct a posterior normal distribution. So we kind of, let's say right now, we have our posterior normal distribution, at least in terms of its parameters, mu and sigma square. But now we want to convert it into a log normal distribution, right? So uh, what we can do is just use a simple mapping. So if mu x is the mean of the normal distribution, then this term is the corresponding mean for the log normal distribution, right? And I literally just code that out in another function right here. I don't really care about the sigma squared terms. Like I could code this out too, but like it's kind of an, it, I think the book calls it a nuisance parameter where it is important in the internal workings, but I don't really need it myself in, in terms of understanding and analyzing. So I just leave it out. So essentially I take my data, which is the list of like prices it's in log normal form. I convert it now into, I take the log of all that data to get the normalized version of that. Then I draw the mu's and sigma's using the function I showed above. So you have this list of mu's and a list of sigma squares. And then you can now convert these um, list of mu's into, well, well, the mean of your log normal, dist your log normal distribution. And note that these now new values are like sampled values from your, they're like actual prices now, right? From your log normal distribution. And so when you have actual prices, you can actually construct a distribution of them, right? Pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I hope that all made sense. So moving on now, let's say that we're, again, we're trying to just compute the data for a week or yeah, the week after uh, getting the prior. So the prior, like before was just one week of control data. The experiment data is like everything after that. Now, uh, I'm doing this, I'm fitting the same beta distribution for computing cell through. So it's, it's actually the same code that you saw in the, in, the last, um, in the last notebook. So I've defined this beta distribution for, uh, as a distribution of purchase conversion. And now I'm doing the same thing, the priors, I'm defining the priors for the prices too, where I'm fitting a log normal distribution for that based on the prior knowledge, like all the information I had before the experiment, which is the first week of data in this data set. Now we can use, now this chunk of code, again, was from the last notebook where we construct the posterior distribution of purchase conversion, purchase conversion specifically, right? So yeah, you can see it's literally the same code where we update the parameters and then now we have now we have two distributions we can sample from them. RVS means random variable sampling. So it's essentially going to get a list of thousand purchase conversions from control, thousand purchase conversions from the treatment sampled from those two respective posterior distributions. Now what we do is we're going to take the we're going to we'll basically compute a couple of priors, initialize a couple of priors, and use those to draw our you know the mu's and sigmas, right? And well mu's and sigmas and hence also draw the the values for our pricing that is the log normal distribution right and so these are essentially like 1000 samples that are prices that correspond to prices in the treatment group 1000 samples that correspond to prices in the control group right now before exact and the thing is that 
even so now we have our prices right now but instead of just comparing these two distributions directly i'm choosing to actually multiply each of these values by a corresponding like purchase conversion value which is why we're doing this purchase conversion step here too and we're doing this because we don't want just gmv we want the expected value of gmv so that we just eliminate any biases that may occur just because the product is higher price like it's evident that prices are higher but you might be cannibalizing some other like you might be cannibalizing sell through because of it and this this piece of code kind of takes takes into account all of those aspects if we multiply them and now this well, essentially, this treatment expected price samples will be like a list of expected values, a list of expected prices about a size of thousand. This will also be the same, same kind of list with the same size. And from that, we just correspondingly can calculate the lift and I'm printing it out right here. So in this last line, it says there is a 90% chance that the, that the lift isn't it's actually not is price the lift in price is six dollars and 87 cents the difference here is actually between the experiment treatment groups and the experiment control group that we're actually seeing and it looks like well based on this i'm already super confident that the price is that this difference is already pretty significant which is great and again this probably owes to just like the large amount of data that we have now, coming back to this section, just so that we're, we're clear, we compute a lift and essentially it's basically saying, hey, there's for, for we have 1000 samples, right? And for 0.2% 0. 0. of them, the lift is less than this value, right? And so we want to find the location here where the price lift is zero and above. That's exactly what I'm doing here. And then, Essentially, well, the, it will, if it says like, okay, that happens at like 10%, right? 0 0.10, where the price here is zero, which means that for 10 for 10 percent of the samples, the price lift is under zero, which means that the control is greater than the test. So that means 90 percent of the time here, where you know the test is greater than control, that means that this is positive value is, and it happens 900 out of 1,000 times. So hence we see that there is a 90 percent chance. I hope that all makes sense. Now we can then run this, you know, let's say instead of two weeks, like we did before, we can, you know, try to run this for three weeks and then, you know, just, just execute everything here and make sure, you know, okay, do we get even better results or more confident results? Just give me a sec. You know, I could have probably just like run this from, from the top, but nah, I'll do everything hardcore. And when this runs, what we expect is, well, we don't expect too much to change. It might be a slightly higher or so, um, you know, chance now that, you know, those two are distinct groups because now that we have more data, we can kind of make more precise uh, arguments and decisions with them. So if you look here, yeah, there's now like a 98% chance that the lift is 7.66. Now, if this number is, you know, acceptable, like in industry terms, you're like, oh yeah, we wanted that. If this number 7.66 sounds like a good lift, then you can probably go forward with the change because we're actually very confident that this lift exists and it is around this number. So now with just one statement, you can see how like Bayesian testing just becomes so much more interpretable. Um, there is definitely a lot of math when it's associated with continuous data like this, but I think if you, if you probably go through it a couple of times and just like try to understand where these numbers are coming from, it, it becomes a very powerful tool. I'll tell you that. And so, yeah, that's kind of all I had for this today. I'm going to put this code kind of where I put the same notebook in the same repository previously so that it's all in one little jumbled place. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you're learning a lot. We are just, we just hit over 100 videos. So I'm super glad and excited. Thank you all so much for your support. And yeah, I guess I'll be seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye.